As we've seen time and time again throughout musical history, every genre has its game changers. Or otherwise, artists who come along and completely reinvent their genre while simultaneously bringing countless new listeners into it. And although this is something that tends to be controversial amongst the older fans watching it happen in real time, in the long run it usually gains these artists some of the highest forms of respect and recognition later on in their careers. Punk, of course, is no stranger to this concept, and in fact, I would be one to argue that some of its most creative and talented musicians were those who weren't afraid to shake things up a bit. And while it typically doesn't look any more glamorous than it does for most punk bands at first, big or small, these bands tend to garner themselves some of the most dedicated cult fan bases in all of music culture. And when it comes to the punk household names who rose to prominence during the late 80s and early 90s, there's one game-changing band who might have the most rabid fan base in all of punk rock. How's it going, folks? My name is Jack Miller. I am the incredibly underqualified punk historian, and today I am very excited to be presenting the first installment in a two-part series on one of my favorite bands of all time, No Effects. As always, I'll be taking you all through the history of No Effects over the course of both episodes, starting with their scruffy beginnings in early 80s Los Angeles, all the way up to their legacy status in music today, of course along with some added trivia and some of my personal thoughts on one of the most influential bands of my entire life. Before we get started, I want to let you all know that I made a Spotify playlist list of some of my favorite no effects songs along with a couple of tracks from the few and far between side projects the guys have had over the years and if you want to check that out you can find a link to it in the description below i also of course have to give a massive shout out to my wonderful patreon supporters thank you guys so so much for your support i've got some bonus content up on there you can check out and any and all donations are hugely appreciated and finally if you are interested in seeing videos about punk rock then may i humbly ask that you please subscribe to my channel here I'm having a lot of fun making these, and I want to make sure that all of you can keep having fun watching them. Anyways! So as a lot of us might already know, the story of No Effects, of course, begins at the hands of childhood friends Michael Burkett and Eric Melvin. The year was 1983 in the city of Los Angeles, and a young Eric Melvin was looking to get a band together after recently having picked up guitar and falling in love with the brand new hardcore punk craze that swept over LA in the early 80s. He recruited his friend Steve from the band America's Hardcore to be the vocalist, along with a drummer named Dylan. And Dylan just so happened happened to know a bass player named Mike, who conveniently enough also wasn't already in a band. And Mike turned out to be a pretty seasoned musician for his age, having already been in a couple of short-lived bands by the time he joined the group with Eric Melvin. Initially getting into playing upon discovering punk rock, and in hopes that being a musician would make him more popular amongst girls his age. But this first incarnation of the band would not prove to be a very successful endeavor on the musical front. And while it may have given them a few new experiences and made them a handful of new friends, it definitely wasn't going to get them very far out of their parents' garages. And it wouldn't be until Mike and Melvin met a guy named Eric Sandin that things would start to shape themselves out for the first time. Gradually, of course, but still noticeable. Now, Sandin had built himself up a little portfolio of sorts through a few bands of his own, one of which was a fast hardcore unit called Caustic Cause, a more experienced band who actually had a decent reputation back in the day that he managed to land a gig with at a mere 16 years old. But despite their music and reputation, the guys in Caustic Cause were a number of years his senior in their upper 20s and 30s, and most of them had girlfriends, jobs, or other responsibilities that were pretty hard for him to relate to as a young kid. So when Sandin first met Mike outside a show at LA's Cathay de Grand, he of course jumped at the opportunity to play with other musicians his age. Sadly, however, proximity and lack of transportation did not allow for the two of them to join forces in a band just yet, but they found they still enjoyed each other's company enough to keep in touch over the phone and and meet up for shows whenever they got the chance. And once the two boys were both old enough to drive, geographical location was no longer an issue, and Sandin would soon find himself properly acquainted with Mike's old friend Eric Melvin. Upon joining them for a first rehearsal, however, Sandin would be disappointed to find out that Mike and Melvin weren't the best musicians around. And even though the three of them all got along really well, it was certainly going to take those guys some time to catch up to him on the musical front. But the trio found they liked hanging out, 
skating and going to shows together so much that the subpar musicianship didn't really matter, and Sandin would end up leaving Caustic Cause in favor of his new band with Mike and Melvin. The group would throw around a few name ideas and eventually settled on NoFX, which took some very obvious inspiration from the name of the Boston band Negative FX. But although Melvin and Sandin quite liked the name, Mike felt it was a little bit too similar. But since he didn't have any better ideas, the group wound up sticking with it, and I think at this point it's probably pretty safe to bet that he's come around to it. But anyways, once Mike had written them a full set of scruffy hardcore songs through which he tried his damnedest to channel the likes of his favorite bands such as RKL, Bad Religion, and The Descendants, NoFX started hopping onto every show they could possibly find around LA, opening up a handful of punk bills at the Cafe de Grand along with various house and backyard parties, and although they were still pretty rough around the edges, NoFX still managed to get their name out there quite a bit, and eventually were even invited to open the Cafe de Grand's farewell show when the venue closed its doors in 1985, sharing the stage with numerous cult classics like Reagan Youth and Sin 34. But despite getting a knack for playing shows pretty early on, like I hinted at before, Mike's songwriting was still a little underwhelming to say the least. So much so, in fact, that it wasn't uncommon for the band to walk away from shows with a few negative remarks from attendees. But a few snide comments weren't about to stop the eager young musicians in no effects, and in 1984, the guys managed to convince Germs drummer Don Bull to help them record some demos. And these demos certainly weren't much, especially if you hold them up against what the band would grow into even a few years later. But scrappy or not, they still proved to be enough for no effects to get themselves some shows outside of LA, and the band headed out on their first ever tour come the year 1985. And a few consecutive nights of playing were enough to flesh out NoFX's sound even more. Not to perfection, of course, but still enough that they felt it appropriate to dive into more recording upon returning home to LA. And after signing what was probably a pretty sketchy deal with Mystic Records, the band released their first ever 7-inch EP. But in typical NoFX fashion, things didn't stay on track for very long. And when the band's second tour conflicted with Eric Sandin's family vacation, he opted to leave the band over the conflict. Mike and Melvin would then get hooked up with the drummer from the band Fatal Error for a short time afterwards, but his stay wouldn't be permanent either, and they eventually found it pretty difficult to keep a drummer in the band after Sandin's departure. Archer. Their longest lasting post Sandin drummer would be a guy named Scott Sellers, who wound up filling in for their next tour, but he would eventually quit the band too when no effects went on hiatus so Mike could go to college. But eventually Melvin would start things up again when he gave Mike a call saying he found a new singer and drummer, and a lot of them would embark on another week-long tour during the summer of 1986 with the new musicians. Sadly, neither of them would prove to be very competent players either though, and this incarnation of the band wouldn't last long after the tour sealing the deal when a riot broke out after their show in Dallas, Texas. During his time away from No Effects, Eric Sandin would resume his own musical endeavors with a band called Anti-Krieg down in Santa Barbara. But just like the many early incarnations of No Effects, this would also prove to be a pretty short-lived endeavor of its own when the band's bassist was diagnosed with cancer. The original No Effects trio would be reunited, however, when Sandin ran into Eric Melvin's mom and she suggested he give the other two guys a call. And after only a few minutes on the phone with his old friends, Eric Sandin was officially back in no effects. And upon his return, the band would record their second 7-inch, So What If We're On Mystic, and it would be released through Mystic Records in 1986. The EP's title actually references the label's sketchy reputation in the LA scene, but with no effects being the young and inexperienced band they were, any label was a good label as far as they were concerned. And Mystic Records was still certainly good enough to put out the EP, and after its release, the band would then embark on another tour, which would also be Eric Sandin's first full US run with no effects. Now, this tour would prove to be quite the eventful experience for all three of the guys, however, its most noteworthy takeaway would be when their friends in subculture gave Mike his now oh-so-famous stage name Fat Mike, after noticing he'd put on a few pounds while attending college back in California. After the tour ended, the no effects guys would then go back to their regular lives of experimenting with drugs and finishing up their educations 
Titans, but the next main event in the band's history wouldn't arrive until they met their first ever lead guitarist, Dave Casillas. Dave was a native to the town of Oxnard, California, and although Oxnard has a bit of a reputation these days for spawning cult favorite bands like Aggression, Dr. No, and Ill Repute, it's actually a much smaller town compared to the larger cities in California. And its small, tight-knit punk scene back then was pretty representative of that. So coincidentally enough, before joining No Effects, Dave actually spent some time playing for a few of the local Oxnard legends like Dr. No, Stalag 13, and Rat Pack. He had always had a hard time sticking with bands, however, and although he seemed to be onto something as the guitar player for Rat Pack, he would eventually end up leaving the band when they started taking things in more of a metal direction. He would get in touch with the No Effects guys after he saw their ad at a music shop, and being bandless and bored after parting ways with Rat Pack, that was all it took for Dave to give them a call. Now, No Effects were of course thrilled because they'd been really itching to bring in a lead guitarist and expand their sound. So naturally, when Dave came in with some cool guitar licks, they let him into the band right away. But it didn't take more than a few shows for them to realize that Dave could be a little hard to work with at times, often showing up to rehearsals and shows late or without all the equipment he needed, or sometimes even just getting too wasted to play. But although it may have been a little ill-advised, that still didn't stop no effects from jumping out on the road for another sketchy tour just like they always did. And of course, wherever they went, Dave's antics followed them closely behind. And now far away from home with only the blurred supervision of his drunken bandmates, Dave began stealing everything he could possibly find as he and the rest of NoFX made their way across the US and back. This tour would also be the one that Eric Sandin would earn a stage name of his own, just like Mike did on one of the last ones, as his farts would smell exceptionally putrid upon taking LSD, a group activity the guys in NoFX all partook in during tours and local hangouts. And after days of both intentionally and unintentionally tormenting his bandmates with his acid farts in the van, the other guys gave him the nickname Smelly as payback. But sadly, acid wasn't the only drug that Smelly would find himself regularly using, and after getting in with not so great of a crowd, he developed the habit of doing H, if you will. Let's keep YouTube satisfied on that one. He would be able to keep his habits on the down low from the band, or at least for a period of time, but it definitely wouldn't take very long for his reckless using to catch up with him, but we'll get further into that a little later on. Regardless of their dysfunctionality, though, no effects, of course, still persisted, recording a brand new 7-inch called The PMRC Can Suck On This in 1987. To release it, Mike decided to have a go at starting his own record label, which he called Colossal Wassel Records, and this EP would, of course, be its first ever release. No effects would then follow the 7-inch up with their debut full-length liberal animation the following year in 1988, for which they'd team up with Bad Religion's Brett Gerwitz at his studio West Beach Recorders in Hollywood, California. During the recording process, Brett would even offer to issue the album through Epitaph Records as well, but no effects still insisted on releasing it themselves, and Liberal Animation would make its debut on April 22nd of 1988 through Colossal Wassel Records. Along with the new album, the band would also shoot two low-budget music videos for the tracks Shut Up Already and Mr. Jones, both of which were entirely made up of clips of the band goofing around in front of a green screen. So then with some new material hot off the press and a solid run of touring and promotion around the US, no effects would then embark on their first ever European tour, squeezing themselves in the door to help out a desperate booking agent who'd originally set the tour up for the adolescents. But getting in touch with that booking agent was about as far as their luck would go, because the shows overseas would prove to be nothing short of disastrous. The band were not only met with similarly underwhelmed audiences, but also found it pretty difficult to maintain morale as a unit, especially since guitarist Dave Casillas' excessive drinking was now getting really out of control. So out of control, in fact, that it would eventually lead to him being asked to leave the band upon returning home to California. This would, of course, leave no effects without a lead guitarist, though, and the band would, ironically enough, find their next one through Eric Melvin's new job. Melvin had taken an off-tour gig at a Fred Siegel warehouse that his uncle managed, and there he made some friends with a few other musicians who just so happened to also work there. And through those guys, he came into contact with a really good metal guitarist by the name of Steve Kidd. Weiler. The pair bonded quickly over their love for playing guitar and smoking weed, and although he wasn't a punk rocker, Steve didn't have any bands of his own at the moment and definitely liked punk enough to play the part, so when Melvin offered him a gig with no effects, he accepted. And despite the faster punk strumming progressions feeling a little bit awkward for Steve at first, he absolutely 
crushed it in the lead playing department. And he certainly fit in with the rest of the guys well enough to be part of the band relationally too. So once he was up to speed with the old and the new material, no effects would hit the studio again to record their second full length album, s and Airlines. The band returned to West Beach Recorders to work with Brett Gerwitz again and spent the month of March 1989 tracking for the record, laying down 11 brand new tracks along with a cover of Fleetwood Mac's Go Your Own Way. During the recording process, Bad Religion vocalist Greg Graffin would also join the band in the studio to lend some vocal harmonies, and I guess you could say this was one of the first steps in the long journey Mike was about to embark on to properly learn how to sing. No Effects would also shoot a video for the album's title track, which featured the band performing on an airport runway, and also proved to be a much better quality clip than the previous two they'd shot upon Liberal Animation's release. The new record officially debuted on September 5th of 1989, and after being offered a second time by Brett to release the album through Epitaph, the band agreed, hoping the well-established label could help them reach a bigger audience. And to their delight, it definitely helped, because following s and Airlines' release, for the first time in NoFX history, the band started to see bigger crowds and much better reactions at shows. But it wasn't just a better video and the Epitaph stamp of approval that displayed a great deal of growth from NoFX in such a short time. The material and production on the new album were far superior than anything they could have done just a year ago. And although they would still continue to joke about being a terrible, dysfunctional band, by the time s and Airlines came out, it was safe to say that No Effects did not suck anymore. So this would of course lead to several more tours, including one that brought No Effects back to Europe. And although it would still be quite some time before the band would reach their peak and later legacy status, like I said earlier, shows were going remarkably well for No Effects standards of the time, including the ones overseas. And for as grueling as their tours might have been during this era, the little extra push had given them a lot more confidence in their band. And riding this momentum, No Effects would return to the studio for a third full-length release in September of 1990. The band recorded the LP over the course of 10 incredibly difficult days at West Beach Recorders. So difficult, in fact, that Brett Gerwitz even quit twice during the process after some heated arguments with Mike. But fortunately, after calming down, he decided to persevere, and he and the band laid down 14 brand new tracks. And when the record officially released on March 26th of 1991 through Epitaph Records, No Effects and Brett Gerwitz both found that their patience paid off when the album sold 10,000 copies within its first year. This record went by the name Ribbed and now carries a cult classic reputation amongst diehard fans for songs like Moron Brothers, Shower Days, and New Boobs that have long since become fan favorite tracks. And much like with s and Airlines, I don't think this was an accident. I doubt I'd be the only one to argue that Ribbed was the first time we got the signature no effects sound on full display, or at least 90% of it. Because this album easily showcased their strongest material yet by far. And while no effects certainly had a great deal of refining to do to get to where they are now, this album at least proved they were onto something, or at the very least had a chance at reaching bigger and better things. Ribbed was also easily the most melodic release in NoFX's catalog up until this point, something the band would become very well known for later on into their career. And I think the touch of jangle buried beneath layers of fast, riffy punk rock was just enough to set them aside from the pack. Whether we're talking about Epitaph Records bands, punk bands from California, or just punk rock of the late 80s and early 90s in general. But alas, great things often come with a great price, and this time the expense was felt the hardest by guitarist Steve Kidweiler. And after coming home in the hole from a couple of hefty tours, Steve soon realized that he just might not be able to afford to be in no effects anymore. Things between no effects's tour schedule and Steve's financial situation would really start to strain when he found out he'd lose his warehouse job if he went out on the road with the band again. And not only that, but he found himself so desperate for cash at one point that he had to sell one of his guitars to make rent. It would all reach ahead during a European tour in 1991, though, and after a disastrous series of events before a show in Bremen, Germany, Steve decided that he'd had enough. And after a cold, hard look in the eyes from reality, he concluded that it was finally time for him to resign from no effects at the end of the year. To make matters even worse, also in the midst of all this, Smelly's addiction would begin to completely take over his life, and he would be finding himself in desperate situations time and time again. In fact, his using got so bad that his then-girlfriend and fellow junkie Courtney Love even told him he was the worst junkie she'd ever seen at one point. And if you know anything 
anything about Courtney Love, then you know what that means. Like I mentioned earlier, Smelly had been able to keep his addiction at bay for a while, or at least enough to halfway hide it from his bandmates. But by the time the early 90s rolled around, it had completely brought him to his knees. Not only that, but he'd also gotten himself tangled up in an informal punk gang of sorts, for lack of a better descriptor, that called themselves the Dog Patch Winos. And while the Dog Patch Winos maybe weren't as notorious or dangerous as some of the other more infamous punk gangs of the era, as I'm sure you can imagine, it was still another thing keeping Smelly from getting his life together. And when you mix substance abuse with formal or informal gang affiliation, I think you get the idea of where things were headed for Smelly. But remarkably so, even the darkest period of his life still came with a silver lining, because all the excessive partying would unexpectedly introduce him to a particularly skilled guitarist named Aaron Abeda, who at the time played for a funk rock band called Crystal Sphere. So when No Effects was scrambling to find a new lead guitarist after the departure of Steve Kidweiler, Smelly knew just the guy to call. Now, Aaron Abeda was a native to Sacramento, California, discovering music at a young age through his mother's vast record collection. He'd gotten his start playing back in elementary school, though, when he took up the trumpet with the school band, and later added guitar to his repertoire once he got to high school. And Aaron taught himself to play by ear, listening to his favorite records and applying what he'd already learned about music through years of playing the trumpet in the school band. But music wasn't his only passion during his childhood and adolescence, and Aaron also found he had quite the knack for comedy at a young age too, memorizing and reciting Cheech and Chong skits along with acting out his own material in goofy cartoon character voices. Aaron's friend and bandmate Mark Curry had some friends in the Dogpatch Winos, so when the two of them moved down to LA and in hopes of getting their band in front of a bigger audience, they actually wound up renting a house with a few of those guys. And amidst all this, Crystal Sphere would eventually see some success, or, well, Mark Curry would see success when Virgin Records approached him specifically with a record deal. But although Mark tried, he unfortunately was never able to sell the major label executives on the full band. And while Aaron and the rest of the Crystal Sphere guys were still able to act as Mark's backing band for his live shows, it still didn't prove to be much of a profitable gig for any of them the same way it was for Mark. So when Aaron's friend Smelly from the Dogpatch Wino crew invited him to try out for his band No Effects, he figured why the hell not. Now at this point, No Effects had been through a series of unsuccessful guitar candidates, with the most promising one being Joe Ramici from the band Jughead's Revenge, but alas, that one was too good to be true. But although he didn't come from the punk world in any way, shape, or form, everyone in No Effects was more than impressed with Aaron's skills on the guitar, and the fact that he he also played trumpet and was a pretty decent vocalist certainly wasn't doing him a disservice either. In fact, Aaron aced the part so much that the only compromise that had to be made was what they called him at practice and shows, since Mike's then girlfriend and later wife's name was also Aaron. So the band opted to give him a stage name upon his introduction, and thinking on the fly, it was Mike who forever branded him as El Jefe for the rest of punk and music history to come. Now, No Effects had all of two rehearsals to prep everything with Hefe, before they headed out on another full U.S. tour. But knowing them, they of course didn't mention that to him until they'd already told him he got the gig. But although he might have felt a little bit nervous and out of place at first, Hefe's muscle memory completely took over once he was on stage with the band. And even though he was still vastly unfamiliar with punk at the time, when it came to guitar, he got the job done better than anyone No Effects had played with before. And it wasn't just his musical skills that would come to use in No Effects either. Because after a few shows of listening to Mike and Melvin's obnoxious stage banter, Hefe would also find that his years of cracking jokes and listening to comedy records would come in handy too. And it would only take a few shows for Hefe to work his way into the band's signature stage personality of snarky comments and shit talking. Amidst the chaos of touring as a full-time member of No Effects though, Hefe still maintained his position as the guitarist in Mark Curry's band for a little while longer. But even if touring in the major label circuit provided better accommodations, he still knew that he couldn't keep up the double dealing act forever. And with his schedule quickly becoming very overpopulated, Hefe soon realized he was gonna have to pick one. And it was during a conversation with the rest of the touring musicians in Mark Curry's band that he had the final revelation he needed. There, he was just a hired gun for Mark, but with no effects, he was being offered a full quarter of everything they did as a band. So although he may not have been sure if it was the right choice at the time, Hefe opted to ditch the hired gun gig and stick with no effects. And once he was fully on board with them and only them, it was of course 
was time to get him on record, and NoFX returned to West Beach Recorders in January of 1992 to begin sessions for a five-song EP. However, this time things weren't as standard practice as they'd been in the past, and especially so for Smelly, who like I said earlier was completely consumed by his addiction at this point. So much so that it was now even starting to take a toll on his playing, and he would be taking entire days to record just a single drum track. Still, the band managed to pull through once again though, and after some adjustments from Hefe on the guitars, they pieced together an EP that sounded even better than the huge step up they had already taken with the previous release. And I have to say, I think their hard work really paid off with this one, because this EP was now getting them more buzz than entire records worth of material they'd released in the past had, and with good reason too. The EP was titled The Longest Line and made its debut on May 1st of 1992, and showcased a much more polished version of NoFX, supported not just by Hefe's adjustments he made in the studio, but also a major leap in songwriting ability from Mike. The Longest Line was also the first ever release from Fat Records, which I'm sure most of you probably know is Fat Mike's now legendary record label that he started with his now ex-wife Erin Burkett. I've actually done an entire video on Fat Rec though, so if you're interested in learning more there, I'll leave a link to that video in the description below. But anyways, for as busy as they might have been, a simple EP wasn't going to be enough to fill NoFX's recording quota for 1992, and in August of that year, they returned to West Beach Recorders again. But like I've mentioned twice now, not only was NoFX busier than ever, but Smelly's addiction was also worse than ever, and after a series of difficult recording sessions, the band gave him the ultimatum that probably saved his life, get clean or be replaced. So he took off to a rehab facility way out in the California desert for a couple months to get his head straight, and although it was a vigorous uphill battle, and especially so in the beginning, he managed to get through the whole program and walk out the door sober and more clear-headed than he'd ever been in his entire life. And as I'm sure we all know, this paid off big time as he came home to the release of NoFX's fourth full-length album only a month after he got out of treatment. The new record debuted on November 5th of 1992 through Epitaph Records under the name White Trash, Two Hebes, and a Bean, and carried with it several tracks that would quickly become some of the most beloved songs in the band's entire catalog. And this record truly gave us no effects like we'd never seen no effects before. And although we'd definitely gotten a good number of hints at it, I have to say I think this was the first time we really got a taste of just how infectious of melodies no effects was about to become very widely known for. And now with the adjustments Hefe had helped them make in the studio, paired with the copious amounts of work Mike had put into learning how to sing properly, plus not to mention the whole band was now firing on all cylinders as a unit too, no effects put together a package that just might be able to take LA Punk to a place it would never have been thought to go before. The band would also shoot music videos for the tracks Bob and Stickin' In My Eye, the latter of which has not only become the most popular video in No Effects's catalog, but also one of the most iconic punk music videos of all time. Now, given the time period and what a high caliber record this was, I'm sure you can imagine No Effects were pulling in some pretty groundbreaking numbers even at this point. But for as much as I don't want to emphasize this, we still can't deny that it wasn't their efforts alone that enabled them to get to this position. By 1992, pop rock media had its eyes on punk more than ever before after a certain power trio from Aberdeen, Washington brought the genre to the mainstream for more or less the first time in history. So when No Effects dropped a hook-ridden punk record of their own roughly a year later, it may not have been enough to bring them to their peak, but it certainly set them on course to becoming another one of the biggest punk bands in history. And it wouldn't be long until the band would start to see some pretty unique and life-changing opportunities start to slide their way, beginning with their return to Europe in 1993, where the band got their first taste of playing in front of big festival crowds. No Effects would also embark on a two-week US tour with Fishbone later that year, which was interestingly enough the only time they ever toured as an opening act. After that, the band would then embark on their first ever tour of Japan in early 1994, and it would be at the end of this tour that No Effects realized things might be about to change for them yet again, after Green Day's game-changing album Dookie came out upon their return and took the 90s punk craze all that much further. And with their last full-length record now two years behind them, No Effects figured they were probably due for another release at this point too. No Effects were also approached by Hollywood Records around this time, and although the major labels were relentless with their pursuits of the band, the guys instead opted to stay with Epitaph. But Hollywood Records wouldn't be the only mainstream media outlet to try and get their hands on No Effects in 1994. And next in line was, of 
course MTV. The band had actually tried to get their videos aired on MTV in the past, but back then, punk was not only still too niche, but no effects also weren't the juggernaut they were well on the way to becoming at this point. So alas, their requests went unanswered at the time. However, now that punk was on the rise in a big way after the smashing successes of Nirvana and Green Day, MTV were all of a sudden pounding on NoFX's door just like they were with all the other 90s cult classics. But after all of NoFX's best efforts to get aired in the past, the network wouldn't give them the time of day. But now just because punk was all of a sudden getting popular, they were all about it? So this led Mike to have a little bit of a revelation. NoFX had gotten to where they were at this point with no help from mainstream media of any kind. So he had to ask himself, how much of a difference was it really going to make? Also, popular music trends always have and always will go in waves. So who's to say the mainstream music industry wouldn't leave them high and dry like it had to so many other artists over the years who came in riding one of these waves? So after some careful consideration and talking it over as a group, NoFX decided to decline MTV's offer as well. And although this may have seemed like a pretty risky move at the time, while all the majors were putting on punk band after punk band, I'm sure we can all agree at this point that this was the best possible decision NoFX could have made, especially considering how sticking to their DIY roots has played out for them now. But although they weren't going to be signing to a major or airing any videos on MTV, that definitely didn't mean NoFX was slowing down. And in fact, 1994 was going to be their biggest year as a band yet. And of course, it began by branching off into new territory in countries like Japan, Brazil, Sweden, and Australia, and building up their massive underground following one show at a time. As I'm sure most of us probably know, however, all of this other stuff is just icing on the cake, because the real meat and potatoes of NoFX's 1994 would of course be their return to West Beach Recorders, where the band would spend several months recording, mixing, and mastering a 17-track LP that would change punk rock forever. The album included 16 brand new tracks, as well as a rearranged version of one of Mark Curry's songs called Perfect Government, and it made its debut through Epitaph Records on July 19th of 1994 under the name Punk and Drublick. Now, if you're watching this video, I think you've got a pretty good idea of how much of a game changer that record was for No Effects, but just in case you don't, this was the true final product of the 90s No Effects sound. And while White Trash and Ribbed were both some damn close prototypes, the band still managed to run miles from their previous two full lengths with Punk and Drublick. And I think it's pretty safe to say that this album set some pretty apparent standards in punk for the remainder of the decade. Even down to its guitar tones and drum tunings, I firmly believe that Punk and Drublick is the real definitive blueprint for what we think of as 90s skate punk. And while No Effects certainly isn't the only influential band from that scene's beginnings, and maybe not even the most influential band it spawned, I still think they were at the very least the most influential band for this sound during this era. For example, Bad Religion might be a more influential band overall, sure. But when we're talking about the characteristics that define 90s skate punk, like the snarly sharp guitar riffs, bursts of vocal harmonies, and stupidly fast drums, it really was no effects, and more specifically this record, that gave us that sound in its most polished form for the first time in history. And even stepping outside of skate punk into the broader scene, this record is loaded with absolutely timeless songs that have really become essential punk classics over the years. So once Punk and Drublick made its debut, as I'm sure we all know, No Effects was officially on their way to legacy status, and the band would find all kinds of unexpected success, major label or not, securing slots on numerous major music festivals, and later on discovering that Punk and Drublick had gone gold. Their newly achieved fame would not come without its fair share of mischief, however, with everything from El Jefe nearly losing his finger at one of the European festivals during the summer of 1995, to Mike developing a habit of taking lots of pills after sustaining an injury of his own, the latter of which would quickly become a moderate issue in regard to Mike's behavior towards his bandmates and road crew on tours, and sometimes even towards crowds during shows. But these are of course a few minor inconveniences in the grand scheme of things, as the band now found their music not only fully supporting their livelihoods, but also the livelihoods of a number of other fat rec bands who are now doing remarkably well thanks to their label's newfound success. And since things were going so well for no effects, they decided to permanently capture that moment in time by recording their first ever live record. A little less than six months after the release of Punk and Drublick, the band would put on two back-to-back -back shows at the Roxy Theater in Hollywood, California, both of which were recorded for a live album the band titled I Heard They Suck Live that made its debut through Fat Wreck on August 22nd of 1995. And although 
Although it wouldn't do quite as well as Punk and Drublick, I heard They Suck Live would still pull some pretty impressive numbers, charting on the Billboard Top 200 and earning the title of Fat Wreck's most successful release of 1995. And Fat put out some pretty impressive records in 1995. But another important change the live record would bring for no effects was the introduction of a new producer named Ryan Green. Now, Ryan had already cut his teeth working with a number of the early Fat bands like Lagwagon, Propagandi, Strung Out, and No Use for a Name. But despite already being well acquainted with Mike and Aaron Burkett, and presumably the other guys in No Effects as well, he was still yet to join the band in the studio. But after excelling at his job producing, I heard they suck live, no effects decided to invite Ryan back for some proper recording sessions this time, and he and the band would hit the studio at Razor's Edge in October of 1995. And during these sessions, Ryan would help no effects put together 13 brand new tracks, all of which would be issued roughly three months later on January 31st of 1996 under the title Heavy Petting Zoo. And even though this record also may not have been as much of a hit, it still managed to do remarkably well when it first came out peaking at number 63 on the Billboard charts. And to be completely honest, I don't think this record really deserved all the hate it got at the time. Was it another punk in Drublick? No, of course not, but when you have to follow up an album like that, you're inevitably going to leave a few of your fans disappointed no matter what. And although it didn't get the most positive of crowd reactions at the time, I have to say I think Heavy Petting Zoo still holds up as a solid 90s no effects release. And I think the main reason people had such a negative reaction was probably in part because it just wasn't Punk and Drublick. Another thing to consider is that up through Punk and Drublick, each No Effects release had showcased a massive amount of growth from the band upon debuting. And while there's still a number of tracks on Heavy Petting Zoo in which we see the band step out of their comfort zone a little bit, the growth and experimentation on this record is definitely a lot more subtle, and it certainly doesn't hit as hard as the stark contrast between the previous five albums did. Like I said though, I don't think that means this record is bad by any means, and I actually really like a number of the tracks on this one. And honestly, I'm probably not the only No Effects fan who feels like this record has an unnecessary bad rep simply because it's the follow-up to fucking Punk and Drublick. Instead, I kinda like to think of this album the same way I do of Rancid's Life Won't Wait, which if you don't know, was the follow-up to their Game Changer record, And Out Come the Wolves. Rancid wasn't gonna write another And Out Come the Wolves right after they wrote And Out Come the Wolves. You can't force the brilliance of an album like that. So naturally, their follow up didn't do as well as their big breakthrough record did. But still, that doesn't mean Life Won't Wait is a bad album, and it seems like most Rancid fans, myself included, have actually come around to that record, and it's a lot more of a cult classic these days. And to an extent, I think this is also true about Heavy Petting Zoo, but maybe it just hasn't had as much of a chance to grow on fans, since no effects have always been a lot more proactive when it came to putting out new releases over the years. While we're on the topic of Rancid, though, I've actually done an entire video about them too, so if you want to know more about their story, I'll provide a link to that video in the description below. But anyways, like many successful musicians often do, three out of four of the no effects guys would begin to make a handful of questionable financial decisions after seeing a good few sizable deposits into their bank accounts. And these decisions range from El Jefe opening a nightclub in Eureka, California, to Eric Melvin and a couple of his buddies running a coffee shop in downtown LA, to Smelly starting his own motocross video series with Jordan Burns from Strung Out called called Moto Triple X. Though the first two of these endeavors were pretty much instant flops, Moto Triple X was a smash success at first and actually had a huge impact on motocross culture, eventually leading to the company starting its own racing team and getting into all the big dog events. However, Moto Triple X would eventually see its demise as well, especially with the rise of online video sharing towards the end of the 2000s. But although he was just as clueless about running a business as the other two guys were when they started theirs, Moto Triple X was still remarkably successful, all things considered, especially when paired up against the corporate competition. But while the other guys were investing in unusual business ventures, Mike, on the other hand, would start a side project that he called Me First in the Gimme Gimmies, a punk rock cover band that would become very widely known for their punk renditions of pop songs from the 70s and 80s. And although Mike doesn't play bass with them too often anymore, the Gimme Gimmies are of course still going strong and touring internationally to this day. But side hustles aside, no effects would of course march on 
on into the late 90s with a now endless legion of rabid fans behind them, continuing to find nothing but success everywhere they went. Making themselves household names at the then brand new Vans Warp Tour while of course keeping up a hefty tour schedule of their own. But the most important next step for no effects here would be the recording and release of their seventh full-length record. And after teasing fans with the short and sweet Fuck the Kids 7 inch, the band returned to the studio with their new favorite producer Ryan Green in August of 1997. He and No Effects would lay down 16 brand new tracks at Motor Studios in San Francisco, and the album then made its debut on November 11th of 1997 through Epitaph Records. The record was given the title So Long and Thanks for All the Shoes, which was a parody in reference to the book So Long and Thanks for All the Fish by Douglas Adams, the fourth installment in his Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series. However, the shoes part was in reference to the frequent shoe tossing from no effects fans it shows. But what really matters here is of course the actual music, and for as much as I'm willing to defend Heavy Petting Zoo, I still have to say this record is definitely a much better follow-up to Punk and Drublick. For one, the production is just a lot cleaner overall, and even though Ryan Green had worked on the last two major no effects releases, I feel like Shoes was definitely his best work with the band yet. Then on the songwriting front, the band and Mike especially were back to making pretty big leaps in growth, but maybe just in a different way this time. Going from white trash to drublick, no effects just drastically improved on all fronts, but by the time they put out Punk and Drublick, the band pretty much had their sound on lockdown. So instead of a drastic improvement, the band now opted for variety, but I feel like it wasn't until Shoes that we saw them fully commit to it. And this time it really paid off for them, because unlike Heavy Petting Zoo, So Long and Thanks for All the Shoes has long since become a fan favorite. So once the new LP was out and pulling in numbers, No Effects jumped back out on the road and celebrated the next two years or so by putting on sold out show after sold out show, hosting a few headlining tours throughout Europe and North America, jumping onto a number of big time rock festivals, and of course returning to Warp Tour in 1998 as one of the festival's headliners. But No Effects weren't done throwing curveballs at us yet, and in June of 1999, the band returned to the studio with Ryan Green with the intention of seeing just how far they could push the boundaries of their songwriting and production. The result was an 18-minute punk rock powerhouse titled The Decline, which made its debut on record on November 23rd of 1999. And The Decline would quickly garner quite the reputation over the years, so much so that it's probably been in the top three most beloved tracks in NoFX's catalog for over 24 years now. It's been performed a good few times on special occasions too, including one where the band played alongside an orchestra at Red Rocks Amphitheater in 2019. NoFX Effects would of course tape this performance as well and release it on record and online, and if you haven't seen the live video already, I would highly recommend checking it out. You can find a link to that in the description below. But now that we're about halfway through the No Effects story, I'm going to save the rest of the history lesson for the next episode. And while we maybe can't discuss the full extent of the band's legacy quite yet, I still think it's important to talk about their significance in the context of this specific era, which I'm sure a lot of us probably think of as the middle of their prime. So like I said earlier, No Effects were essentially the punk blueprint of the late 90s, and there's some pretty big names that are very evident of that. A great example of this can be seen in the Fat Wreck documentary, because literally all of the label's classic roster mentioned that they'd been listening to the earlier No Effects albums when they started their bands. And if you're familiar with these bands and this era of punk to almost any extent, then I'd say the sound pretty much speaks for itself. And I don't think any of these other bands would have gone nearly as far as they did without the blueprint of No Effects. And when a sound is so encompassing that there's a whole laundry list of other successful bands that came up channeling it in some way or another, there's hundreds of more bands in the underground doing the same, and that is exactly what happened in the late 90s. Of course, some of these bands were a lot more original than others, but the bottom line is that NoFX invented a subscene with their music, and if you've been paying attention to underground punk for the past 30 or so years now, then you're probably well aware that even though it might have taken a lot of twists and turns over the years, it still very much exists. And whether the gatekeepy, tastemaker dorks were ready to admit it or not, by the late 90s, no effects were just as crucial to punk rock as Bad Brains, Dead Kennedys, or even The Clash. And although it would still be another decade or two until we got things like Backstage Passport or Fat Mike's Fat Mike, there's still plenty of evidence that this type of fan engagement was happening long before the digital age. Think about it, what other band can you think of that has a live record as 
beloved as I heard they suck live. Probably not very many, and honestly, I can't think of a single one. And as weird as this sounds, that's because it's not just the music that makes no effect such a crucial pillar of punk rock. The personalities of the band and the four guys who make it up are genuinely entertaining to pay attention to. And to be completely honest, this was something punk had never seen before at the time. Of course, you had band personalities like Suicidal Tendencies with their fuck what people think shtick, Bad Brains with positive mental attitude, Miter Threat with Straight Edge, or even the Circle Jerks and Live Fast Die Young. But at the end of the day, the primary selling point of all these bands was still just their music alone. And thus, their personality didn't really need to extend any further than face value. But when NoFX came on the scene with their improv comedy shtick in between songs, it totally changed the game. Because it wasn't just, here's our band, this is our message, now we're gonna shut up and play so you can slam with them. It was a brand new experience at every show because the band was reacting to and commenting on what was happening there in real time. That and it also wasn't just one consecutive personality for the whole band. It was four different ones and they all reacted to the same things and to what each other said about them in a different way. And part of this might have come about just to keep crowds entertained since no effects didn't have as much to offer on the musical front back in the early days. But even if so, once they did have something to offer musically, the stage banter just worked that much better. And to be completely honest, I really think this is something no effects set a trend with in punk rock as well. And whenever a band or musical artist has this good of music and this much personality, they're going to get attention whether they want it or not. It's the same type of phenomenon that happens when there's a big historical or catastrophic event just on a much smaller scale. It makes itself such a big deal that it's just impossible to ignore. But the attention that no effects got and what they chose to do with it is just another thing that made them such a game changer. A lot of punk bands were approached by majors in the 90s, and while it did wonders for some, it also completely destroyed others at the same time. But no effects not only had the balls to tell these big companies to fuck off, but they also showed the audience that it absolutely was possible to take punk big time and do it all on your own terms. Sure, Green Day, Nirvana, and Rancid might have gotten bigger, but for every one of them, there's a Jawbreaker and a Sam I Am. And even if you were lucky enough to be a Rancid or a Nirvana, outside of your hit singles, it's still just gonna be your diehard fans that buy all your records and wear your shirts. And in the process of going major, you're probably gonna alienate some of that core audience that came up with you. But by staying independent, no effects managed to sell their whole audience on the whole album every time. And while it's definitely easy to just throw that out there looking back in retrospect, the thing is, it had already happened time and time again back then too. Their live album charted on Billboard in 1995. Whose audience is going to make that happen other than No Effects? And the thing is, this isn't the legacy status No Effects audience in 2023 that I'm talking about here. This is the No Effects audience in 1999 when they were still a pretty new band by most people's standards. And if something is skyrocketing this high, this fast, it's gonna keep going up before it comes down. And if you've made it this far into the video, then I think you probably know that's exactly what happened. Well, I think that about does it for our first installment in the No Effects series. I have had the best time writing and planning this one out, so be sure to stick around for the second one. I'm going to try and have it out in the next couple of weeks or so. But that's enough from me. I want to hear what you guys have to say. What's your favorite No Effects release of the 80s and 90s? Did you get into them during this era? And if so, what record was it that pulled you in? Or if you're someone like me that got into them a little later, on, what is it about their back catalog that struck a chord with you so much? Let me know in the comments. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you next time. You the bag of shit, you suck, I can't believe we'll walk you out and stop the start on me and my pants falling down.